23 miles north of Memphis. My mother's family was some of the early settlers in Gibson County, and so a lot of those descendants were still in the area. She used to drag me to these afternoon social visits with my great aunt Ellen. Now, in my region of the country, people said aunt, and nobody thought that was odd. I moved to Florida. I soon found out folks down here say A D T, <laughs> and they looked at me like I was putting on airs. Now I am from the South, and I know putting on airs and saying aunt does not qualify. <laughs> My great aunt Ethel was not my favorite. She was intimidating, to say the very least. She was old. I don't know how old. She was just O-L-D. <laughs> and she wore her hair all knotted up on top of her head, and her eyes were wide set, piercing. She wore these old-fashioned glasses, you know, with the wire rim around them. And they sat about right here, and she'd peer over those glasses at me, and I felt like she was seeing straight through me. Well, she always seemed to have on the same cotton dress. Had this big old wide pointed collar and a V-neck and a self-fabric belt, you know. And the sleeves came down here to her elbow, and they kind of rolled up. And she sat with her legs wide. So it made this big, wide lap. And she kept in that lap whatever she was working on or whatever she was reading. And you could see her garters roll down beneath her legs. And then she had these old-fashioned, leather shoes, the black kind with the lace-up with that chunky two-inch heel. Well now, my great aunt Ethel was not one of these sweet, genteel little southern ladies that would bow her head at the mention of Sherman's name. <laughs> oh no, she was like a Sherman tank. If you didn't stand by her or back up her opinion, she would mow you down. And her predictions were legendary. Well, she had this uncanny ability of just putting her hand on the belly of a pregnant woman, and she could pronounce the sex of the unborn child. She'd say, you better get to knitting some blue booties. And sure enough, a boy would be delivered. You just might say that she was the forerunner of the ultrasound machine. <laughs> she even had a newspaper column. In our little town, the paper only came out one day a week. And so when folks got that paper, they ran to it and opened it up to Ethel's predictions and opinions column. While people trusted her, they relied on her. After all, she predicted the drought that the farmers suffered. She predicted the flooding of Fork Deer River that just ruined the cotton crop. She even predicted the dust bomb. Weather just seemed to be her specialty. <laughs> and one day, one summer day, she was out there fanning herself on the porch, and she said, mark my word, one of these days, there's going to be air conditioning, and boy, it'll be the ruination of our children. Why, they'll sit inside and get fat and lazy, and then put an end to all the social storytelling on the porch. <laughs> but by far, her most famous prediction appeared in the newspaper in big, bold print, capital letters. It read, Jesus is coming on the two o'clock train from Memphis <laughs> next Tuesday. <laughs> and people believed her. <laughs> well, they started scurrying around making preparation. 
Well, some people just kind of quietly left town. They just disappeared. My great aunt Ethel's phone was ringing off the wall, and the party lines were busy. Did you hear? Ethel predicts Jesus is coming on the two o'clock train from Memphis next Tuesday. Well, did she say he was getting on in Chicago and coming on the express? I bet he gets a sleeper car. <laughs> oh, I think he'll just be on the passenger car like all the rest of us. Well, what are you going to wear? <laughs> well, I'm going to wear my Easter outfit. <laughs> reckon we're gonna recognize him? <laughs> For goodness sakes, Emma Kate, you passed by his picture a thousand times on the Sunday school classroom wall. <laughs> and so it went. <laughs> well, they erected a tent, big, wide tent on Main Street between City Hall and the United Methodist Church. Well, they were going to have all day preaching and dinner on the grounds. So the food committee got busy and they started to plan the menu. Well, in our part of the country, pulled pork barbecue is a specialty. But somehow that didn't seem right. <laughs> and so, <laughs> they thought about it, and they decided, okay, we will have Bobby Joe's fried catfish, Emma Chase angel food cake, and Miss Virginia Hunt's homemade bread, a meal to die. <laughs> and the good cooks of Methodist Church started preparing the food for the faithful. And then they thought, well, how much should we prepare? And so they turned to my great aunt Ethel for a prediction. And she said, he will provide. <laughs> Well, the next thing you know, my great aunt Ethel is down visiting the mayor. She's trying to convince the mayor to give Jesus a key to the city. <laughs> <laughs> and the mayor protested. He said, Ethel, he has the keys to the kingdom. <laughs> <laughs> well, the curious and the sanctified showed up at the depot, <laughs> waiting for the two o'clock train from Memphis that Tuesday. Electricity was in the air. And my great aunt Ethel and the ladies from the Methodist Bible study, prayer circle, and missionary society made their triumphal entry. My great aunt Ethel's driver, Timothy, moved her car right up to the front of the platform. And that's when they saw the light of the two o'clock train for Memphis. And they heard the whistle blow and it pulled into the station and at that moment the VFW band struck up onward Christian soldiers and then the Masons rolled out their banner and said welcome Jesus <laughs> well the people on the train began to strain and stare and say Searching up and down 
that barks one to spot Jesus. <laughs> and then, all too soon, they heard the conductor say, All aboard! And that train started slowly making its way to its next destination. And no one had stepped off that train. Much less Jesus. <laughs> That's when all eyes turned my great aunt Ethel. <laughs> Just the day she got her comeuppance. Well, the newspaper fired. There was no more Ethel's predictions and opinions. Now, my family is still very sensitive about this subject. <laughs> so please, don't tell anyone that I broke the code of silence and shared with you about my great aunt Ethel's fiasco. <laughs> but you know what? The devil made me do it. <laughs>